I don't know. I don't know. Actually, don't put. Don't put seriously, seriously, don't put. Don't put that in the teaser. I don't. I don't. I honestly don't even know if this is a secret. I'm not even joking. Seriously, don't put, put that in the, I, in the I, fucking yeah. teaser. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Leon's like, I'll, I'll cut you. Like, I'm not even playing. <laughs> I will. I will, like, digitally stab you. It's not even a thing. <clears throat> can I, have, I put I the... Have a straight razor you can use. <laughs> can I put the part in where you threaten you Johnny? Your own straight razor. Can, See, sta- can you stab people with straight razor? I feel like it's more of a cutting... I mean, it's only it sharp. Cut, it's only I mean, sharp on one, one thing. I mean, you, you could stab it. You'd have to stab with, like, the broad end, I guess. Because, you know, that'd be weird. It's possible, but not ideal. Yeah. I think you're missing the point here. The point is, someone bought Homefront. Yeah. <laughs> what assholes! You're like the least jolly man that I know. After everything that I've done for you. <laughs> you mean to me? With with you. <laughs> Your compliance plays a part in it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to another exciting and in-depth episode of the Euphemism Analysis Podcast, where myself, your host Johnny Maloney, leads you through some of the most comprehensive political analysis that the podcasting world has seen, but nobody, and I mean nobody, can actually figure out what it is we're saying because we refuse to talk straightforwardly about it at all. In today's episode of the Euphemistic Analysis Podcast, uh, we look at Egyptian President Morassi. Has he greased the Pope? And how many sneakers will remain on the telephone lines as a result of his mamboing? Austin Yorsky brings us a report on the tenuous situation in the, between the UK and the European Union and asks the question, is it too early to brick up the elephant? And Leon Thomas brings us a report that the gun control debate in America continues to rage and it becomes important to ask ourselves what measures will moisten the hedgehog just enough not to widen the underwear gap. Leon, did you wind the grandfather clock? If so, I hope it was after filling the lawnmower with gas, if you know what I mean. So much did I do that thing you just said. That's great. Hey. Tell us about it. Oh, I first I started it, and then I did it. Did you say moisten the hedgehog? Yes. <laughs> I don't think you're supposed to get those things wet. Aren't they, they're like burrowing animals. It's uh, Austin, please. Yeah? We're not talking about a real hedgehog here. Well, I don't think we're talking about anything, to be fair. We are. This is the most comprehensive, in-depth political analysis podcast on the internet. To be fair, that's not a very high bar. It's true, which is why I aimed for it, because I knew that we could get there in only just the first two minutes. Great job, guys. Pat yourselves on the back. I just did. I I didn't hear it. I didn't come through the mic. Can you do it harder? No. I, I, I refuse I refuse to do it again. Uh, it, it would be sensationalist. It would be too vulgar a display of power to do it again. <laughs> I, I really wish I had the creativity to match Johnny and his ridiculous euphemisms. I, I'm just not up doing that right now. He said hedgehog, and I just shut down. This cheese will not melt, Austin. I need you to step up to the podium and break bread with the pioneers. You're just, like, reading out of a dictionary, aren't you? No. You're just picking random words. Uh, no, nope. these words are very carefully chosen. Okay, I believe you. You'd get your hands on the snowman if you really knew what you were investing. <laughs> I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. It's like you, you go out of your way to pick like the most alienating opening bit at all possible when you know we can't even keep up with like a normal one. It's, it's all about mixing it up. I mean, you know, you can't, you can't just establish a routine. You're trying to keep us on our toes by knocking us down completely? Well, yes. <laughs> okay. I confess! I'm, st- I'm just waiting for one of these days where you actually give one where it's just like, hey, let's talk about video games, and then we just do that. It'll happen one day. I'm not telling you when. I'm not telling you how. I'm not even telling you where. Well, if you're not here, then I don't think it's going to catch on the recording, so... Oh, it'll catch. What's you going on? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Leon. So today, yeah. uh, on the day of the recording of the podcast, there has been like no news, but I played a bunch of video games. Leon, did you play a bunch of video games? I played two that I'd like to talk about. Okay. How many games did you play, Johnny? Uh, not very many. Not very many games. I think I probably played about three. I think. So that's a, I think it's a total of 11 games we played this week. So <laughs> That does mean that we're going to be listening Altogether. to you for a long time. Well, I some of these are very Leon these games, so I, I, oh, I hope he has a lot to say about them. I will. 
His you voice, like that he... His voice is like honey in my ears, which incidentally, I don't recommend that anybody actually ever do. Some people hate the sound of my voice. Do you know that? Every time I, I have a new episode of Renegade Cut, someone says, I hate your voice, or some variant of it. Well, people, you know, who was it that described my voice as the high-pitched, scratchy nerd whine? Well, that was me, but I was right. <laughs> <laughs> I, somebody independent of you. I mean, somebody who listens to the podcast. They were they were trying to. Some somebody mentioned in one of the, one of oh. the past episodes. They were like, I can't tell the difference between Austin and Johnny. And then some guy was like, Austin's the one that speaks with a little bit more rhythm, and Johnny's the one that has the high pitched screechy nerd whine. Oh, and Leon's the only one who sounds like an actual like man, like a grown up. He sounds like a human being, and for that, yeah, I he ha- he <laughs> brings dignity to this podcast, which wants for it desperately. Johnny, you sound like a really articulate Muppet. <laughs> you, you're, you're, you're like the Muppet that teaches kids big words, but nobody likes that Muppet as much as like the Count that does math. Right, right. Sorry, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I can be, I can, I can relegate myself to a niche position on Sesame Street. I can do that. Especially now because I'm perfectly equipped for it. Oh, God, you want to talk about your Muppet, don't you? I don't have to talk about my Muppet. I mean, this is not the Let's Talk About My Muppet podcast, but... See, that would have been that would have been an opening we could have got behind, because then there, there are jokes about things being put up your ass, because it's a puppet. Yeah. See, right there, that, that right, that, the jokes write themselves, but no, you gotta grease the fucking porcupine, no, so... No, the Pope gets greased, we're moistening, moistening the hedgehog. Uh... Those are words, These are but very, I, th- very, I liked my order of words better. They're very distinct. They're very deliberate. You don't want to grease your porcupine. That is, like, who would grease a porcupine? Honestly, Austin. Oh, jeez. Can we lubricate the echidna? I, I think that's conceivable. It depends whether or not you're interested in a water-based lubricant or uh, possibly one that's, that's silicon. Is there going to be propylene glycol involved? Because if there is, I am leaving right now. No, you you always use a water based lube. You always do. I I'm sorry. I don't know enough. I don't know enough about lubricant to have this conversation. You're I need such an a, adult. You're, su- you're such a child, Austin. I know. I'm twelve. What is this? Uh, so, Leon, do you want to talk about video games, or you want to talk about lube? Video games, surprisingly. You want to go first? You got video games? You oh, oh me? Oh, me? Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Um, I played two games uh this week, and they were both GameCube games. Um, because that's something I do now. Uh, I've decided to go back and play a bunch of games that I missed uh, during the era where I briefly did not play video games, and also just some games that I missed along the way for some dumb reason. Um, Because buying new games coming out right now, I don't know. For some reason, I just... I I, I don't want to play the games that are coming out right now. I don't know what it is. It's not even that I I think they're going to be bad. I just, for some reason, my, my... Attention is going backwards or something. So I played two GameCube games, and one of them was Beautiful Joe. And it's really surprising to me that I've never that I, it took me this long to play it because it seems like a game sort of designed for me. Uh, it's bright and button mashy and funny, and it's really goofy. And, and it's it, it's and I'm, I started playing and I was like, yeah, this is exactly the kind of game I want to play all the time. And it's just it's just fun. It's just you scroll along the screen and you blast people and you go henshin every once in a while and then you turn and then you turn into the thing and then you lose your power but then you build up strength to go and you go henshin and you do it and then you just smack guys and robots and uh, it's a lot of fun. I really like the graphical style. In fact, when, while I was playing the game, I was thinking even though this is a GameCube game and I can sort of tell this is GameCube level era graphics, the style of it. It, it 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 sort of I wouldn't say it's timeless exactly, but it feels like it's less dated when they do it in that sort of over the top cartoony bright and fun way. You know, it's, yeah. it's it's like it's like playing Wind Waker today, even though it's last gen. Well, actually, it's like, now that there's the Wii U, it's two gener two Nintendo generations ago. But Wind Waker still looks beautiful just because of the way it was designed. It wasn't designed to be like you know so intensive, you know that uh. You, you care that it doesn't look realistic. It was designed to look like a cartoon, and it looks like a really good cartoon. Uh, so I played Beautiful Joe, and I also played, for the first time, Super Mario Sunshine. Uh, it, it was like the Mario, or the Mario game that I just 
did not play, and I, I, I waited a long time to play it, and I finally played it, and it's good. It is a lot of, it is really good. People seem to crap on this game because it, you know, it was between Mario 64 and Galaxy, and those are amazing, but, uh, Sunshine's good. Uh, the only problem I have with it is, um, I'm crap at aiming the water. Uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's, it's the, uh, the controller I'm using. But uh, I'm crap at aiming the water. Uh, I'm getting through it anyway. Uh, but I like it. It's it, it's it's a fun game. It's you know it's it's mar- it's three D Mario platforming. So of course it's going to be good. Um, it's uh, it's odd because the, it, for those who haven't played it, I mean it starts with Mario being accused of being a criminal, and then all these guys saying, "Well, Mario, we think you're horrible, and you need to go." fix everything on this island. But uh, it's really being done by someone who looks like Mario. But then everyone sees that it looks like Mario, and he still has to go do it. So I'm a little confused about where this is going, you know, story-wise. Story, well, is, you, story is usually not a huge part of Mario, but um, also, fairness, also... Okay, go ahead. In fairness, I mean, you know, like, if something had gone wrong and it didn't even look like Mario had done it, wouldn't they still be like, hey, Mario, you kind of have to fix this? Because isn't that what he does? But he but he didn't do it. He didn't do it. It was someone who looked. He doesn't do any of it. I mean, you know. And so they just go, "Oh, it wasn't you." Listen, you know, would you do us a solid and fix it anyways? Here, here's another thing. It's Mario. You should know by now that he's not a bad guy. I mean, I feel like he should have some street cred even on this island. You're you're assuming that there's a continuity between the Mario games, though. There is. <laughs> I, some, some of the Mario. Some of the Mario games have like a semblance of continuity, but it's much like Zelda in the sense that they don't care so much about things making sense as they do with things being fun. Yeah, fun is more important. I agree. I, I definitely agree, especially when it comes to Mario, which is you know, like I said, it's not story heavy. But uh, I'm I'm just trying to wrap my brain around this uh, a little bit. It's just weird seeing Mario in jail. It's like, it's like I mean, it, but the thing is, it, it's not like. It's like a dark Mario story. He's just in jail and and but still kind of smiley. It's it's odd. I don't know. I imagine that even being in jail in like the Mushroom Kingdom would probably be a pretty delightful experience. Yeah, it would. I bet they bring you. Cake. It's not like you know. I mean, it wouldn't be like Oz in the Mushroom Kingdom. You know, it would probably still be pretty like, oh, you did a bad thing. We're sorry. You did something wrong. Now give me a hug. Yeah. Come on. It has to there, be a really deep one. Sentences in the Mushroom Kingdom must be uh, must be carried out with with full hugs, not a frame hugs either. None of this like sticking your butt out. No, I'm talking like hip contact. The, like, the streams must cross. They give you five to ten years of friendship. In this situation, the streams are euphemisms for penises. Peni, please. Peni, I'm sorry. Peni. Yes. Yeah. It's funny, though, because Sunshine is a lot like Wind Waker, but not only in that they are GameCube games, but that when they were first kind of announced slash coming out, everyone was, like, pretty furious, or at least the people I knew were. I was, this was a little bit before I was on the internet with any regularity, but I remember people being absolutely angry about both the graphical style of Wind Waker and the, the water, you know, gimmick from Sunshine. And then people have kind of looked back on those games fondly. They're They're pretty well well thought of today, so I guess they're kind of vindicated by time and quality. Yeah, Wind Waker uh, is actually it. Might, it might be my favorite Zelda game. I mean, it, I mean, I don't. I'm, it's too early to tell about Sunshine, but I will say Wind Waker is probably my favorite. It it just it's it's a world, you know. It feels like a really uh, living world uh, playing through that game, and it's pretty. Yeah, I, have to I like say Wind that Waker. My favorite, my favorite Zelda game has got to be Majora's Mask. I, I'm a Majora's Mask guy too. I still haven't finished it. I've it's never the, played it's it. The, it's the it's the <laughs> oh you're trying to be a hipster and say Majora's yeah. Mask. So now you make me look dumb because you were saying it for like indie cred and then I said it like legitimately. No, I, I know, no, I know that you're a fan. We've talked about this oh. before. We've talked about how Majora's Mask was your uh, is is your favorite Zelda game. So which, which is funny though because it's I, I like it because it's like the one that breaks the 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 mold the the Zelda tradition of like all these you know eight dungeons and everything like that. And if you guys watched the Nintendo Direct event that Nintendo did like a week ago, they said that the new Wii U Zelda game will be another one of those, where you're, that's going to be something un, not traditional. You're going to be able to do the dungeons in any order. It's going to have some kind of multiplayer component. There's a, there's a lot of things that they're talking about that this might be like the new Majora's Mask in a sense. Guest directed by Quentin Tarantino. 
Cool. I I would play a Zelda game that was directed by Quentin Tarantino. I I, I would too. I, I would probably play any game guest directed by Quentin Tarantino. I I've always said this, and I know this is like not I'm like the millionth person to say this, but I think it'd be interesting if they did like a gritty Mario or Zelda, like for one just one off one. Like I'd never want them to stay that way, but I think it'd be cool if they did like one where it was like Suda fifty one Zelda. Oh, did you ever see there was a there was a oh what was his uh the guy who draws Hellboy. Um Mike what? Mignola. Mike Mignola, the guy who draws Hellboy. Mm-hmm. He there's there's like guest art of, of him like drawing a Mario picture kind of in the style of Hellboy. It's it's pretty funny. I, I'm not a big comic person, but I did like the Guillermo del Toro movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's oh, and on that on the other game Leon played, uh, fucking Beautiful Joe is tits. That's a platinum game, isn't it? It's Clover it was Studio. Like Clover, yeah, yeah. Which became platinum, yeah, uh, eventually. So they're responsible for like Okami and God Hand and Beautiful Joe, and then they when they made their own company, they basically kept making those games as platinum. If you're interested in having a look. Our buddy Taylor on Blizzard Thumbs actually has uh, has just posted, I believe, a playthrough of Beautiful Joe Two. Yep, and he also did an episode on the original original Beautiful Joe. Mm-hmm. And in in somewhat video game related news, I wasn't going to bring this up, but now you've already you've you've opened Pandora's box. Here it comes fucking Taylor. If you if you don't know, or also Shinkara is the name of his show. If that's what you're familiar with, he's a San Francisco 49ers fan. And if you're a football fan, you know that they are going to the Super Bowl next week. So that's a football thing that's going on, but more importantly, the uh, Madden, the latest Madden game, they run a simulator on the Super Bowl every year to see who would win according to the game, and according to EA, the Niners are going to lose, so I'm pretty excited about Taylor's Tears. Uh, I think that's kind of karma for liking Resident Evil 6 and DMC Devil May Cry and Teddy, the laundry list of things that he is atoning for. He's is- calling you out, Taylor. You going to take that? He can't respond because he's listening to this in the future. That's true. So I'm pretty excited for the Ravens to win. If for no other reason, then he will feel sad, and then we can we laugh at him. But if the Good. Ravens win, don't you know that Leon is going to be going through absolute and utter hell dealing with his city for a night? I'm pretty sure he'll just stay home. I'm gonna. <laughs> yeah, he just locked the door. I'm not sure a door will be. I always do. <laughs> I, live, I live in Baltimore. I always lock the door. <laughs> Ah, uh, urban crime. Mm. <laughs> is it all right if I imagine your entire life is like season four of The Wire, Leon? Only if I get to be Bubbles. I've never seen that show. I can oh, swing that. <laughs> I can swing you being Bubbles. Okay. From the Power- Powerpuff Girls? No, 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 from The Wire. Austin, God, you're so young. <laughs> Pay attention. I've never seen The Wire, but I've seen Powerpuff Girls. I've I've seen The Wire. I've never seen Powerpuff. <laughs> since since we don't have a lot of news, I stories, have seen both. Oh baby, I am your king. As soon as, as, soon as I said I, I uh, I've never seen Powerpuff Girls, um, my wife who was sitting across the room looked at me like, "What? She can't she can't hear what you're saying, but she can hear what I'm saying." So you guys will talk about Powerpuff Girls for a little bit. That was a surprisingly good show. <laughs> yeah, I, I all I know about it is that it was made by the same guy. Oh wait, no, it wasn't. Crap. I, I want. I wanted to say it was made by the same guy who did Samurai Jack, but now now I'm thinking. I, now now I'm, now I'm thinking. That. Now I'm thinking. Um, no, it was Dexter's Laboratory who was made by the same guy who did Samurai Jack. So now I'm wrong. I like Samurai Jack. That was a good. I don't know if you, I briefly mentioned this last time, and someone asked me on Twitter what I was talking about. I briefly. Tr- I'm trying to get into anime, if for no other reason, to be able to review anime-based games. Yeah. So. That's a thing I'm experimenting with. The I watched Full Metal Alchemist, and it it completely fell apart like, near the end, but the rest of it was pretty good. I think I, Wire was one of the best TV shows ever made. I agree. I, I've heard that. I, I I really need to watch more television. Don't don't say that. Well, don't, well, no, you, you just, should really just, categorize just it. Good, because, yeah, good <laughs> I really need to watch more good television. Yeah, like, my brother's trying to get me to watch Breaking Bad. Like, I'll get around to that. Oh, it's only awesome. <laughs> <laughs> only awesome? Yeah, like that's the thing I'm gonna do. I'm just trying. I'm trying to get through like the couple like really highly recommended anime, and then I'll get some TV shows in me. But I gotta watch. What other like, anime do you have on the line? I'm just curious. Uh, I'm, apparently I need to watch Cowboy Bebop. It's pretty good. What? Style over substance, but here's substance. Watch Kino's Journey. I think that was one of the ones that someone on on Twitter there you sent go. me. I have that in a list. But yeah, that that's a thing that's happening. I don't know if I'm cut out for it. I watched like. A little bit of tsunami in like middle school, and that was a little bit much for me. Eh, that doesn't always have the good stuff. I liked Gundam Wing. That was some, that, that's 
that spoke to me because they were giant robots, which is a thing that I enjoy. But uh, good for you. I know. So Johnny, do you want to go next, or do you want to talk about what I played? I, is, you know what? No I'm, giant robot. I'm easy going. I, I, there is. I did play a giant robot game. Are you still playing Strike Suit Zero? I am still playing Strike Suit Zero. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about that then. Well, uh, Strike Suit Zero is a game about a suit that strikes more than zero times. So why is why isn't it called Strike Suit more than one zero? I I believe it's called Zero because it's a prototype. Um, you know, you're you're all familiar with with the plot, right? You play this kind of on the fringes of the military, almost got dismissed from his job because of stuff. And then, like, you know, the army's like, okay, we'll take you one last time, but you've got to pass this tutorial, I mean competency check, on your ability to fly. And then during it, it's like, oh my god, there's war everywhere. I've got war in my nose. And then, you know, you go to, like, save some dude who's also got war in his nose and, like, some of it coming out of his ears probably. And then they're like, wait, we can't leave. We have to take plot device with us. Um, and plot device uh, in, in Strike Suit Zero is a woman who has merged with uh, an artificial intelligence. You know, she's gone and skynetted herself. And um, the army or the navy or whatever they call those space soldiers um, have, like, you know, put her away in this, like, secret base because they're just like, you know, she's really good at her job, but she's kind of crazy. Because she'll be like, oh, we have a 100% chance for victory if we, like, nuke everybody. And the army's like, I, I don't think we should do that. That seems wrong. And she's like, do it or don't, bitches. Um, so they stick her away in this place, and you have to, like, go save her because the people that you're fighting against, which is, like, this colonial fleet that's rebelled from Earth, are all, like, rampaging around the galaxy with this secret weapon. That's just decimating everything. So you go to save this AI control, and then she's like, wait, there's a strike suit, zero, that we need to take, because it's our only hope for victory. And then the whole army is like, well, yeah, okay, you know, she's pretty good with her predictions, so somebody go get that strike suit, zero. And then she's like, I have chosen you, player! You are the one with the highest percentage possibility of leading humanity to victory over other humanity in the strike suit. And so the commander's like, well, he was on probation, but okay. And then you get in the strike suit zero, and then you blow everything up. Good. Like, can you name, like, another game that is similar to it in gameplay? Is it, like, Galaga? Is that what we're dealing with here? No, no, actually, you know, it it bears bears similarity uh, in in terms of its flight mechanics, at least out-of-the-box flight mechanics. Um, It's compatible with, like, joysticks, and, you know, you can plug peripherals and controllers into it, but, you know, like, most of the people, I'm assuming, who are going to be playing it are are probably just going to have a keyboard and a mouse. Um, And right out of the box, it actually has a tendency to play kind of like Freelancer. Um, in the sense that you're a behind the craft, uh, you know, and you direct the, 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 the angle of attack basically where your, where your craft is moving towards or where it's facing with the mouse. So you get this aiming reticle in, in the screen. And as you move it to the sides of the screen, uh, because it's not a fixed perspective, like it would be in a cockpit where you're steering the, the whole ship, you know, you're, you're steering kind of the direction of, of the the suit in front of you and then as that aiming reticle nears the edge of the screen the camera then moves to compensate for that um so it's it's actually remarkably easy to play just with with a keyboard and a mouse um the the gimmick of course being that a few missions in when you get the strike suit uh zero um it's uh it, it can transform from, like, just a regular spaceship, which flies and zooms and shoots and bangs and zips and whistles, uh, and it transforms into a big fuck-off robot of death. Um, and the big robot has, like, different control options, you know? So it might be easy to say that this is, like, the sweet-ass space Macross combat game I've always wanted but never got. Um what? Was this a was this a kickstarted game? This was a kickstarted game. It was announced. It had been announced like before they decided to go to Kickstarter. And I remember out of the gate, 
I did actually – I was I was really, really curious about it. I was like, ooh, this looks neat because not only did it look to me like it was probably going to be – you know, like I was amazed because it looked like it was going to be a console game. But they were like, oh, we're making this game for PC, and it's going to be like, you know, space, mech, transforming robot. And I was like, that, that sounds like it's going to be a console game. Nobody makes that game for PC. I know because I've wanted that game for a long time. Um, and then when after you know like the whole the whole Kickstarter kerblooey happened, um, the company Born Ready Games, I believe, is their name. Uh, they uh, they were like, ooh, Kickstarter. So then you know they they jumped in on some Kickstarter, and it is I suppose then the second successfully Kickstarter game that I have had the opportunity uh, to play. Well, you played FTL and Kentucky Route Zero. Um, I, yeah, I, but the thing is, I, I did not back Kentucky Route Zero, unfortunately. Ah. I didn't even know that was a Kickstarter game. It was just like, hey, Kentucky Route Zero. I was like, yoink. Uh, so I should say, sorry, I should amend this. It is my second, uh, video game that I have Kickstarted successfully, uh, that I've had a chance to play. Uh, so, sorry? W- w- what do you think about the Kickstarting thing finally coming to fruition, like the, all the games you've played so far, you've enjoyed, right? Yeah, I, I am. I am absolutely enjoying it, you know, and it's like, it's it's an interesting, it's interesting for me to think about it because there's, you know, there is, is a real, uh, not necessarily a disconnect in terms of, you know, like a, a lot of the times when I play games, when I buy and play games, I will think to myself after or during playing it, God, you know, did I really have to spend X amount of dollars on this? Or, you know, I'm really glad I got this for only X amount of dollars. Um, this is not happening uh, with my Kickstarted games. It's it's not. You know, I'm, I'm not playing Strike Suit Zero because it's, I think it's retailing for $20 right now. I think they're selling it on Steam for $20. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, sorry, the collector's collector's edition is is thirty dollars. The uh, the regular edition it's on sale right now. The the regular edition is is twenty dollars. Um, I'm not, and I I play I paid more than that. I put more than than twenty dollars uh, or even thirty dollars for the collector's edition into buying Strike Suit Zero or funding Strike Suit Zero, whatever you want to call it. And I'm not I'm not actively disappointed by any like you know problem I might have with the game against the amount of money that I've spent. I don't know if that's because I kickstarted it like months ago and that money is already spent or if I'm just like really thrilled to have helped get this game to be made that I'm like, "Wee!" But it's uh it, it's pretty good, you know? Like I'm I am enjoying it. It's not without its problems. Um there's there's a me- like the transforming mechanic kind of bothers me. Because it's like you can't just spontaneously transform whatever you want. You have like an energy meter. It's like, oh, the strike suit can only remain in its like, you know, strike mode as long as you have some of this energy. And you build this energy up by killing enemies in your other form, which is never explained. You know, I mean, it's obviously a gameplay mechanic, but I'm just like, oh, I just want to transform and shoot everything. Because it really is just like transform, and then you hold down the missile lock button and waggle the mouse around, and it's like fire ninety missiles, and they all just go. It's like it's it's all the space war. It's pretty good. I like it. So wait, you're bothered by the you have to charge up energy by destroying ships, but you're not like questioning where all ninety of those missiles are stored. No. <laughs> they just they just assume there's a pocket somewhere on that suit. Fucking missiles everywhere, man. Tons of pockets. So sure. many... Yeah. You... I mean, Austin, come on. You must have seen Macross at some point in time. I, I am aware of things called Macross. Veritech fighters are like... 80% of their mass is missiles. So, you know. And I am being a little... I'm exaggerating a ton. I <laughs> missiles, please. More like 75. It's a lot of missiles. It's a big suit. It's not like, you know, we're not talking like uh, you don't go to, like, Moore's Clothes for Men and be like, yeah, look, please, and they're just like, oh, what's your waist size? No, I mean, it's big. It's a fucking spaceship. <laughs> Got engines and shit. I'm also playing uh, More Sleeping Dogs, which went on sale on Steam yesterday for $10, and if you didn't buy it, you're a sucker. Um, and, and More Dishonored, which is great. You were, you were very enthused about the Square Enix sale. I was, I, they, I, you know, I can't love them enough right now. I want to walk their dogs. 
Hitman Absolution was like seventeen bucks, and that came out like two months ago. That's that's a pretty deep cut already. I know. I was very thrilled about that. Well, you know, I mean, pretty thrilled. Because I know that Hitman was divisive. I know that there were a lot of people who were like, this isn't the Hitman game I want. And I was like, really? Because it's the Hitman game I want, so shut up. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't take things seriously as divisive anymore after DMC. At this point, unless there's, you know, unless their blood is spilled, I don't want to hear anybody's shit. My favorite, my absolute favorite about the DMC, <laughs> Devil, <laughs> Devil May Cry story, is... The bunch of people who tried to lobby government saying that it was against their rights. Yeah, I saw there's the the government petition for the on the like the White House website. Cause they they said that Capcom having that game on shelves violated their their like freedom of some. Bo- they don't even like is like troll logic. I'm pretty sure that it was like satire that got out of hand because there's no way. People signed it for serious, though. You know that somebody went to the the White House website and was like, you're right, the existence of this game in lieu of a real sequel to Devil May Cry infringes upon my right! You know what, people? I'm just going to go ahead and say this. There are still slaves in the world today. <laughs> presence of a sequel to a series of games you love that doesn't go in the creative direction that you want is not a violation of your rights. At most, it is a company making a shitty decision that they think is going to net them more money. That is a really not that is a really great way to shut anyone up who complains about any minor thing in their life. It's like there, there are, are still slaves. If you can wake up in the morning and you're not shackled to a wall, dude, you're okay. Even okay, even if we lived in like some kind of like sparkling future utopia where there was no slavery or sickness or anything, uh, it's your rights are never infringed upon by someone else making a thing, unless it's like a death ray and they put it on the moon and they're firing it at you. Yeah, it's um, I I. Mm. But, I mean. Yeah, I mean we're we're getting far afield here, but that that's a thing people say like when whenever so someone says something that's wrong, like just factually wrong, and you call them on it, and then they're like freedom of speech, and it's like yeah, I, you have the freedom to be wrong, but you are still wrong. The I don't. Uh... One of the one of the greatest tragedies I think perpetuated on contemporary Western society is the idea that every every idea is worth the same amount of consideration as any other. I mean, I have no problem hearing all the ideas, but I, I'm I'm gonna tell you when your idea is terrible. I have I have, I have, I have a problem hearing all the ideas. <laughs> There's too many ideas. I don't want to hear all of them. I'll just give me a give me a few good ideas and just leave the rest on so, the by the wayside. So many of them are just a waste of time. So many of them. <laughs> and you know what? My like my first idea is stop fucking wasting my time. <laughs> <laughs> idea number one, top of the memo. Uh, so that's, I mean, you know, I, like I'm not gonna mouth off about Dishonored or um, uh, uh, um, Sleeping Dogs too much, because I, I, unfortunately, I had a, I had a, a busy week last week. I, you know, I celebrated a birthday, um, and um, the fallout occurred a- across this weekend, so I didn't really get as much gaming in as I could. But uh, I'm really excited to shave tonight. <laughs> Everyone's super excited as well for you and I, your face. I've got face. a badger brush and everything. I got a straight razor for my birthday. I'm a man now. Whoa! He's gonna Sweeney Todd himself. You bet I am. In the middle of a musical number in my bathroom. Great. So, oh. anyways, accidentally slitting my throat aside. Austin, tell me, you've played all the games this week? Yeah, there's no more games left. I played them all. Wow. So I don't know what I'm gonna do That's with the rest of my life. In in respect of this tremendous achievement, I award to you the entire internet. May you guard it against those that would abuse it. I think that's kind of a lost cause at this point. <laughs> um, yeah, I played like half a dozen games, but it's kind of uh, a lot. Of, a couple of them are quite short, so it, I might be cheating a little bit. I'm padding my stats. I heard a rumor that you played another Professor Layton game. Did I? I don't I've, know. There, I just, there's no more Professor Layton games. I played them all. Oh, okay, all right. Then I'm, never mind. Then this rumor was faulty. You were misinformed, son. I, I am misinformed. I, I did play... I, I played some things that I think Leon wants to talk about. Or at least I want to hear Leon talk about them. Leon. Yeah, I'm here. I played Mega Man 9. Nice! And I played... Meg, 
I played Mega Man Ten. Oh, hey. you're you're a great man. Just just, I, just for playing them. I need to know something here, okay? okay? Just for the continuity of my own education into the realm of Mega Man. Um, <clears throat> Mega Man Ten. Is yeah. this also known as Mega Man X? No, no, dude, that's stupid. Stop saying things. <laughs> no, <laughs> how dare you? Even, no, even, I'm, even I'm, pre- I'm just playing. I am, no, I uh, just no. <laughs> no, I'm no. Familiar with Mega the Roman. Man, all right, no, I will explain. Mega Man. There's the classic Mega Man series, and that takes yep. place in, in 2000 X, and it play and and the actual regular Mega Man. Uh, you know, Mega Man one through ten. Uh, they did one through eight, and then they waited a long time, and then they brought it back with nine and ten. Mega Man X came out. Uh, I think right or, after. Or, Mega, sorry. I think. I um, think right after Mega Man Seven came out. Mega Man or X came all, out. X, or all Mega Man one through ten. On the Nintendo Entertainment System. No, no, because, um, I mean, for example, 9 and 10 came out recently. Okay. All right. But anyway, um, Mega Man X is its own series. X does not mean 10. X just means X. In fact, Mega Man is referred to as X in the game, just X. Um, It's sort of it's sort of arguable whether or not it's the old Mega Man because there's sort of some people say yes, but he, his parts were used, but it's complicated. But anyway, so there's Mega Man X, and that's a series, and Mega Man. Uh, there, there's all these different Mega Man series, uh, but yeah, the, X is not ten. But anyway, wh- what did you think about uh, Mega Man Nine and Ten? Okay, well, I think I might have mentioned this before because we brought up Mega Man, and I've said that I've played quite a few Mega Mans, like. Five maybe. I, I can never remember which ones I've played though, because they all kind of blend together. Uh, I know I've played some of the Zero games. Um, I've played uh, like one or two of the mainline games. I forgot how fucking hard they are. Yeah, well they're supposed to be. That's that's part I know. of the appeal. Mega Man Nine kicked the shit out of me. I'm not even gonna lie. Did you beat it? Uh, no. Ah. No. I'm. I- <laughs> Mega Man 9 is a lost motherfucking cause. Uh, I got to Wily in Mega Man 10. I haven't beat it yet. I probably will. But Mega Man 10 is more my speed. There's a lot less blind jumps into, like, fucking fight, like, instant kill spike pits. Like, like I understand that it's convention. I, I appreciate that it's, it's like, hard, hardcore, old-school difficulty. But I maybe I'm just not as good as I used to be. Because I remember very distinctly beating some of the old Mega Man games as a kid. I, I There was one I had, I think it was for, like, a Game Boy Advance. The final boss was named Sigma or something. I very distinctly remember beating that one. Yeah, Sigma so, Okay, so I know I've beaten some of these games, but when I turned on nine, I was like, "Yeah, I got this. I st- I still got the old magic." And then no, I couldn't. Even, like I, I I think the first stage I went to was like Splash Woman because in, in my mind I was like, "Okay, I gotta start somewhere. I'll start with water because water beats fire. That's a good place to get on the chain of beating." And it was just instant kill spike pit after instant kill spike pit, and I was just like, "Oh Jesus, I have no idea what I'm doing." Ten was a lot simpler. I just went in there. I was like, "Sheep man, that guy sounds like a pussy," and I kicked his ass. And then sheep was electricity. Electricity beats water. Water beats fire. And then he kind of went in there. Yeah. So that was an easier chain to get my head around. But nine, nine was absolutely devastating to my self esteem. Well, here's the thing. I mean, they made ten uh, after sh- some people complained that nine was hard because by the when they made nine, it was it was uh, just a few years ago. And just a few years ago, and up till now, uh, games have sort of I want to say slightly easier, uh, to, to put it mildly. Games Gamers are, are used to an easier uh, ride. And when they made 9, a lot of people liked it, but people who are new to the idea of Mega Man or people who um, just have gotten used to the idea that games are easier now had issues with it. So when they made Mega Man 10, they made it a little easier, and they made easy mode. So, yeah, it's 10... 10 10, I mean, I, I like 10. I, I like 10 a lot, but I feel like Capcom budged a little when they made it. They they said, let's make this a game that just about anyone can play. But the thing is, I mean, all you need is all you need. It's, it's not like it's not super frustrating like Catherine or something. All you need is reflexes and memorization and to, to be any Mega Man game. It's It's just yeah. it's just it's just a hard road, but it feels great when you beat it. I didn't feel as great when I beat ten as I beat when I beat nine. That's just me. I, I can imagine. It's, I mean, it's for me, it's the memorization thing. Like, if I, this is a game I had when I was a kid, and it was like, you know, you only get like two games a year, and you have all this time to soak it in and memorize it. Yeah, it, I, I feel like I would love it. But you know, in this kind of where I beat five games a week lifestyle that I've committed to for some insane reason, that I'm probably just never going to get around to finishing nine. But 
Okay, here I noticed something on the on the earlier podcast. You mentioned that Mega Man Seven was the the quote unquote like bad one. What makes a bad Mega Man game? Too, uh, too easy, and and the levels just aren't. Uh, I, I I don't remember um seven and eight that well. All I remember is I remember it being a little too easy, and the level design just not really being that 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 interesting. I mean, but to be fair, by by seven and eight, I mean they were pumping out like one a year, and it's like. You, you run out of ideas, and sooner or later, you, I mean, in the early ones, you had, like, cool, you, you could, I mean, make, think about it, in Mega Man 1, it was all very basic, it's like, there was, like, a first fire-based one, so it was, you got, you got, you got Fireman, and you got, you know, Cold, uh, and by 2, they sort of branched out, and by 3, you got some cool ones, like Snake Man, and later on, you, but eventually, they sort of run out of ideas, and it's like, oh, I don't know, let's look at the Zodiac, Gemini Man? Slash Man. It's like all, all you, yeah, all Slash. Wait, wait, Slash Man. Is yeah. this a, a Mega Man villain that writes like gay hentai fan fiction? Actually, it's it's the Mega Man villain who was once part of Guns N' Roses. Ah. That's where I thought you were going to. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, so um, it, it, basically the the series just kind of lost steam and they ran out of ideas and that that was that was that was seven and eight I think as I recall. What do you- what do you think about like all the sub series? Like I've played a couple of the, the X's and a couple of the I guess zeros and X, like a battle network or two. X is great. I didn't. I did, actually didn't play the, like the last two X games in like the later PlayStation uh, era stuff. But the SNES uh, X games are great. They, those are like the real X games to me. Um, I I I don't have por- I don't play portable, so I missed a few uh, Mega Man games that I st- that I'm actually going to play. Now, not this moment, but now that I've learned how to play old portable games on my computer somehow. Um, Leon. So, um, <laughs> they're not in production anymore. So, um, anyway, so that's, that's gonna be a thing. But, um, anyway, I hope that explained 7 and 8. I know. So what else have you been playing? Cause we've been, we've been talking about Mega Man a lot, which is fine by oh. me, but I, I wanna know more. Well, um, after last week, we talked briefly about, like, games that people say aren't games and this whole – the idea of, like, pretentious art things, and uh, I was getting all frustrated. So I played a couple of things. I I think Johnny is at least familiar with the first one, uh, Dear Esther. Yep. Finally got around to Dear Esther. If you if you don't know that it's, a, I guess, a Source Engine mod that was recently remade and, like, with better graphics. Um, and it's basically you're just on an island, and you just kind of explore while someone narrates – and then it's over in about an hour, and that's really all it is. Um, there's a lot to say about it, although most of it is spoilers, I guess. <laughs> although it, it, it's not really a story-heavy game per se. It's more of like an idea-heavy game. Um, hmm. Did you play? I, it, did you play it more than once? No, although I, I, I do realize that some of the narration is uh, like se- semi-random. Like you get to certain event flags, and it'll give you one instead of the other. Yeah, the game it changes up. Yeah, so I mean I. Here's the thing. I, we talked about last week. I said, you know, visual novels are games, whether you, where you'd like to admit it or not. I said, that, you know, The Walking Dead, Journey, these are super video games. Um, Dear Esther is also a video game. If, if you don't think it's a video game, uh, you're wrong. Like, I, <laughs> I, I usually try not to be, like, super pushy about my views, but, I mean, unless you can run the EXE file on your paperback, then I don't want to hear about it being any other medium. Again, it like I mean, it it bears repeating one of the points that you made last week about how it would not succeed in any other form. You know, you couldn't read Dear Esther the book, you couldn't watch Dear Esther the movie. <clears throat> it the it like it fleshes out um, with several playthroughs, varying it up, and depends entirely on how you decide to explore your own surroundings. Yeah, it's a confluence of the music and the visuals and, and the writing and stuff. It, it takes elements that you couldn't get across. You can't get the music if it was a novel. You, if it was a film, you wouldn't be able to, at your own pace, explore the island, look at all the graffiti. There's like a, a motif of like ethanol molecules yeah. that are, are like graffitied onto the sides of things. It's like you wouldn't be able to explore that. You, you'd be shown it, but it would be a different feeling than coming across it. So I, I, I think Dear Esther justifies the fact that it is a video game, although I would be quick to say that it's not a fun video game. I did not have fun playing Dear Esther. Uh, I, I just kind of, it, it was, you know what, I, the first thing that came to my mind, I said, this, it's Samuel Beckett as fuck. <laughs> good, good. Well, that's that works for me. I actually like Samuel Beckett a lot. Me too. Yeah. It, 
it, it was it was very end game. It was just like things are happening. They're making me kind of uncomfortable. I I don't want to stop, but I'm not happy about what's happening. So it's just get, you know, it's it's that feeling. It's kind of something's off. They're not going to tell me what it is. Let's just let this sit on my psyche for a couple hours. So if if you guys if anyone's listening has ever read uh you know some like modernist theater or something it's 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 absurd but it also has it it's has not, it's actually it is not that absurd that, it, it uh, initially presents as absurd mm. um like on the first playthrough yeah but it like uh, s- several playthroughs in really starts to form a pretty distinct picture. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, it, I don't want to go into spoilers, but I think I have a pretty clear view of the events in the game. Like, I could I could lay everything out pretty linearly. It's not like there's a big mystery about everything. No. But but there there is wiggle room. It does kind of come across as the rantings of a sedate madman. Yeah, and there there's certain ideas of like um like people have come to this island before and they're kind of repeating the same thing. And that, you know, there, there's something that happened in the past. And it's actually, it's super, super fucking clear what happened in the past. It's mm-hmm. just the circumstances around it change. Like, yeah. So all, all those elements are going to be there every time you play. But And the, how the, good is the narrator's performance? I mean, really? I mean, I, narrators have been killing it recently. There was Bastion, which yeah. is an amazing narrator. Then you have, it was recent to me, the Stanley Parable. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's it's another one up there. It's It's a... It's it's not it doesn't have like a strong personality as perhaps you know like Bastion's narrator, but it's still it was still a very effective use of that. Said it before, I'll say it again. That that game made me cry. Yeah, I I, I didn't feel any mo- here. Actually, I want to talk to my other game I played because I, I I kind of have a a grander theory here, a, a grander statement to make about art games that I'm going to wrap up with this last game I played. I think I might talk about one more, but this this one in particular, To the Moon. Oh, I hear that's good. Uh, Johnny, are you aware of To the Moon? I've, I, you know, I bought it when it came to good old games. I mm-hmm. have not had a chance to play it yet. All right, it's a video game version of Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, a decent uh, Jim Carrey film, and it, it is it is I think it's been made I really in. I like R- that movie. I I like it. Um, here it's made RPG Maker, and actually at the beginning it gives you the sense that it's going to be like a turn based JRPG, but then it's like a joke, and it turns out to be like a point and click adventure with some puzzle aspects. Yeah. So like they bring up a battle menu and they're like, "What are you doing?" It's it's pretty funny. <laughs> the, the game is um, you are a character who his job is to go to dead like people who are dying and to change their memories in such a way that they die happy. It's it's you know basically an expansion of the Eternal Sunshine conceit, but it's all it's it's pretty much w- most well known for being super sad. And to the moon, it, it is you know genuinely uh, touching in a lot of moments. But I think what I love, my favorite part about it is because Dear Esther is pretentious. Like I don't, I don't throw that word around lightly. I feel like it's really reductive and dismissive to say something pretentious. But I think Dear Esther is in its own way, and that might be to its its benefit. It has certain pretensions of profundity that lend itself well to that atmosphere. To the moon has certain levels of like depth. But it doesn't take itself so seriously that you feel like you're slogging. Like the characters are pretty funny. They're like, they constantly talk about like how cheesy everything is. There's like one party's like, what happened? He's like, I don't know. It's just some some stupid stuff is going on. Like it's like really sad stuff. But the characters act kind of like people do in real life, where they'll make light of of sad situations like as a defense mechanism. So you never feel like you're getting mired down in melodrama. So I, I appreciate that. However, I think of all the games I've played recently, uh, this is the one that I feel least uh, kind of justifies being a video game, which is interesting to me because it's the most video game e. It has point and click stuff where you have to find all the items. It has puzzle stuff where you have to like solve the little, the little um, it's like a a grid system where you have to like reveal some pictures. Like there's all these oh, things. Oh God, what did you do, Austin? What do you mean? What did you play? I don't understand the question, John. I'm playing to. I'm talking about to the moon, dog. Oh, okay, really? Oh, to the moon. You're saying uh, like doesn't justify itself as a yeah. video game. It has way more video game in it than, say, Journey or The Walking Dead or Katawa Shoujo or Dear Esther. It's more game than that, but I think it would be better. I think To the Moon would be a better film. Mm. Uh, that's my feeling on it, basically, is that nothing in there, you wouldn't lose anything in the switch to the medium. Like I feel like you would lose parts of Journey or The Walking Dead if they weren't video games. I think To the Moon 
wouldn't. And maybe that's just personal preference, but I don't feel like the puzzles add anything. I don't think like the point and click adds anything. I think the staging of each of the sequences in the game are perfectly fit for like a tell us, you know, for, for a screenplay. They, they, they play out very naturally that way. And also I think I would appreciate, like, here's the thing about like the pixel art style. Obviously it's like eight or 16 bit look. Like I've talked about this before with Lone Survivor. That's no barrier to telling a good story or getting certain feelings like that lone survivor is 8-bit it's scary as fuck it's not 8-bit it's closer well, to 60 it's it's bitty to the moon is also uh bitty but i think <laughs> I, I would have appreciated some of like nuanced gestures and like facial expressions and stuff there's some of that stuff you missed that i feel would have enhanced that experience i'm not saying the game doesn't look good it does but that this is a situation where I think maybe the art style doesn't do it any favors. And I, I, that's, I feel that might be a controversial opinion, especially because as game journalists, we're like super, um, and we're, we always get like up in arms and we are like always trying to grasp onto the newest hot indie stuff, like, you know, Braid and Limbo, which I feel are kind of overrated. We were like all over that. And it's like Fez, we're all over that. It, it's, it's kind of a thing where no one likes to go against the grain and say this new indie arty thing is, is not perfect. But I feel like to the moon, while sad and well executed, it is not quite as appropriate as some of the other things I've played recently. I can uh, I can appreciate those statements. You sir have justified your your argument um, very adroitly. And I, I just want to say though, th- for kind of one of the overarching things that I took away from this recent del- delving into all these games that share, share kind of like a similar reputation, um, what works about for example, Katawa Shoujo versus, say, uh, The Walking Dead or To the Moon, I feel a lot of it is, like, people say, oh, when you play The Walking Dead, you're, it's going to be so sad, you're going to cry, you love these characters. I played The Walking Dead, it was great, I didn't cry, I wasn't sad, like, at all, and the same thing with To the Moon, and I think a lot of that has to do with how you identify with them, or at least how I do. Like, I, it is sad when people die, but I've never been attacked by zombies, I don't know anybody who's been attacked by zombies, like, how am I supposed to empathize with that, and, like, To the Moon... I mean, I, I haven't grown old. I haven't looked back on my life and been sad about things I didn't accomplish. I, I don't have the option of hiring. Man, I remember science. what it was like to be 12. But you know what I'm saying? Like, where there are scientists who can engineer your memories. It's, it's kind of hard to put yourself in those shoes where you've been to high school and you felt kind of awkward and you wanted to date girls. So there, I feel like you can, you can get into that more. Maybe, I was maybe. never awkward in high school. You're always awkward, Johnny. You think so? No, you, you're like the least awkward of us, but maybe you shouldn't be. I feel like you don't know that you should be awkward. <laughs> I think that is my greatest strength, and in the end, it will be my downfall. It, it just reminds me, because uh, there was an article two years ago on BT by uh, Micah, where he he talked about um, oh, how... Oh, yeah, the- how... how, how tr- I remember the article, I remember, uh, about how it's almost impossible to properly relate to... Like any character in, a, I mean, I'm obviously exaggerating, but it was like how it's impossible to relate to any character in anything because their life experiences are so, as a sum total, completely different than yours. Yeah, it was quite a controversial piece. Um, but he he basically said, especially video games, but across a lot of mediums, e- even the most down to earth story is kind of stuck in certain things that make it hard to approach. Like you're not, a, you, you I mean, you probably have not been a badass soldier. You probably have not saved the world from intergalactic evil. There's these, you know, even then, you you probably don't live as awesome as a life as someone in, like, a more grounded universe. Like, Grand Theft Auto, you've never stolen a car, let alone, like, shot a hundred gangsters. Like, yeah. Like, Leon, you've never done any of those things. No. Well, I mean, they haven't found the bot, so technically it didn't happen. Yeah, if you don't get caught, it didn't happen. It's only murder if you're in jail. It's true. I mean, I, I, I want, like, I don't think there there's anything wrong with escapist fantasy. There's nothing wrong with power fantasies. Like, I don't want them to go away. I just think it would be interesting if we had more things that were a little bit more grounded. Is that, I mean, is that really what, what drives the video game industry, though? Is that, like, I mean, because if that's the case, The Sims would have sold like shit. <laughs> the, the Sims? I, I've never really gotten the appeal. My, I, I, my wife the, is playing The Sims right now over I'm not. No. I'm not. I'm not even joking. Supernatural expansion. Supernatural expansion. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then I guess that makes everything different. <laughs> it does. Oh, I, I, I. But I. I. I mean, in the sense that if I mean, if video games are all about escapism, 
then, yeah, The Sims would have sold like shit. Because it's not about escapism. It's about, like, getting your house and finding a job. It's a, a lot of video games are kind of just, like, faster versions of real life where, you're like, m- micromanaging things. You're, like, you're, you have a, you know, you're basically just getting rewarded for your work faster. It's like grinding in a JRPG. You get yeah. the reward after putting in hard work. It's it's a microcosm of real life that just feels satisfying in the short term. It's about risk-reward. That's all it is. It's about putting your skill on the line, you know, like, in varying degrees of time scales, making your best shot, and either doing it or failing. Nobody in their right mind, when they play Skyrim, is like, fuck yeah, I'm like a trained dragon slayer now. Nobody in their right mind. That's why I think it's I think it's so funny that things like Farmville are super successful. It's like who wants to take time out of their like boring normal life to do farm work? It sounds like drudgery, but it appeals to people because it's just kind of like it's a smaller version of work and you feel like you're getting somewhere in a sense because you're like, oh, you work for, you know, years to get a raise in Farmville. You put in hours and you get some fucking crops like you did it. I, you know, one of the, when, when I was playing, uh, Hotline Miami, when, when I, I got advanced access to it, um, I made a joke on my Twitter, which was like, you guys, I think Hotline Miami is transforming me into a killer, but only in Florida in the 1980s from a top down perspective. The idea that that, that stimulus, you know, like, I'm not I'm not running around in Hotline Miami being like, yeah, I'm killing all these dudes. It's a puzzle. And it's that way with a lot of games, where really what they're presenting to you is something that you, you need to figure out the right way to do it. And granted, now that we have, like, more open-world games and games where you can choose your skill trees and develop your character and get your class and choose your experience and upgrade your bits and be that guy, there are more than one, there's more than one way to skin a cat. I mean, uh, Dishonored, uh, which I said I was playing right now, and is my amended game of the year for 2012. It is all about just being like, here's a problem, these are all the tools at your disposal, this is the area it takes place in. Go nuts. And I think it's... It's funny that you should say that, because a lot of people say about Dear Esther that it's not a game because all you can do is, like, walk. But there's a lot more freedom, I feel, in Dear Esther than in To the Moon. Like, in Dear Esther, you have all this whole, like, island, and there's all these buildings, and there's all these rooms, and you can just kind of, like, look around and stuff. In To the Moon, like, you really only can go where it tells... There's no branches, all very... I think there's, like, one optional scene that I'm aware of. Everything else is very on rails, even though it does stop you every once in a while and say, hey, solve this puzzle. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm coming off cross really negative. I liked To the Moon. Uh, I just feel like it, it, for some reason, it didn't get a lot of the criticisms that I feel it probably deserves while games like Dear Esther got, like, an inordinate amount of criticism when they probably should have gotten a little bit more understanding. It's weird to me that sometimes people get all up in arms when, when something they don't like happens. Like, why would you be angry about Dear Esther? Were people, there, were people angry about Dear Esther? I, maybe I not. Mean, I, people were accusing it of not being a game, but I mean, it's I, obvious from the get-go that their opinions don't matter. <laughs> I don't know. Go to, go to YouTube sometime or something. I think you'll see there, there are quite a, pe- a lot of people who are who are a little angry about it. It reminds me YouTube. Why? What, what is this cubism? What What is this? You're ruining art. What is this impression? You're ruining art. What, you know, what is this modernist literature? What is this? What is this dadaist movement? Eat the goats. <laughs> Dada is hilarious. You bet it is. So I, I just hope that video you games. You know what? I just I just had a stunning revelation. Oh, I geez. think Dada was the first troll. <laughs> uh, we have to do a, like a history of trolling. That, that, that's an article idea right there. I think, I think that's it. I think the Dadaist movement is, is, like, is the origin of trolling. Oh my god, Austin, this is big. This is like, this is like mm-hmm. national, national treasure big. <laughs> <laughs> we need Nicolas Cage. Uh, I, I'm still waiting for Nicolas Cage to be in a video game, just like as himself. I'd play that game. I would too. I think anybody would play that game. God damn it, the internet would jump on that shit. I think you should collaborate with David Cage. (laughs) Oh my god. 
I, so they, I would play a David Cage game gladly. If you want me to not play that game, that would be the way to do it, yeah. I thought, I think that, here's what I think, I think that Guillermo del Toro should tap him for insane. That game's never coming out. Yes, it is. By, it, by the time it comes out, it will be pretty late. You're such a negative Nelly, Austin. I, I'm just saying. Did you, you guys hear about Star Wars? Speaking of directors. Jar Jar yeah. Abrams? Jar Jar Abrams, yeah. I have no enthusiasm left for Star Wars. Does that make me a bad nerd? No, no but but uh, I have lots of enthusiasm for this because I just I, I I have I want to allow myself to to be excited about it. That's that's basically what it comes down to. I don't I, I'm cynical about a lot of things. I don't want to be cynical about a thing that I like a lot coming back. You know, I I I've I've accepted that it might suck. But I want to enjoy just being excited in anticipation for it. And if I mean, yeah, I, I I like him fine. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, apparently he's he's very divisive. But even though um, I wasn't crazy about the fact that they made Star Trek really actiony, he didn't. I don't. He wasn't entirely responsible for all of that. That 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 that's more studio mandate for what they wanted from him. What even they if he for was Star responsible, Trek. even if he was responsible, though, we have to recognize that that if he's capable of doing that to Star Wars, that could yeah. be awesome. That's that's true. And and what my feeling on the on the Abrams um, Star Trek uh, movie is that even though I don't like what they did to Star Trek, I have to acknowledge that it was a good action adventure movie for the most part. And I really like Super Eight, so I I I, I think this is fine. I, I, I'm totally okay with it. I, I, I you know, I, I don't want to say, oh, bleh, you, you know, some of Lost was weird. You know, I don't, I don't care. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I want to be excited, so I'm allowing myself to be excited. That's the bottom line. I'm on board. Okay. I gave up on uh, uh, on Star Wars ever meeting like my childhood expectations a long time ago. <clears throat> it, you know, like for so long, it was, it was, it was canonized as me uh, for me, excuse me, as like. One of the best movie trilogies, and then they had like amazing toys, and there was like fantastic video games and and all this shit. You know, I'm still waiting for them to make another Tie Fighter. Um, but like, you know, uh, after the prequels, which I think uh, could have been managed better, yeah. Um, and just you know, the resultant video games coming out of that, I was like, you know what? They're just movies. Do you ever play the Pod Racer video game? Don't yeah, you I, I actually, fucking I think, start with me. <laughs> I think I, I think I played a demo of it once and not liked it. That's all I remember. I I remember enjoying it, but I have the feeling that I I, I was wrong. <laughs> like if I went back and played it, I would be very wrong. Wait, wh- do you not like Pod Racing, Johnny? <laughs> not especially, no. <laughs> you don't mean it, it wasn't worth that half an hour of episode one? Oh, good God. No, I, uh, you know, and so, but, it, like, in any case, at, at this point in time, I'm kind of like, hey, you know, J.J. Abrams, go for it. Wow me, dude. In, in I'm fair, also, it, here's the, I'm oh, also, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, more thing, Leon. Uh, I'm also, actually, I am, I am quite happy that uh, the guy writing the script, I think it's Lawrence Kasdan is his name. I'm, I, re- like, I, I, re- I remember, oh, God, what what did um, the, the guy no, he wrote, did? He wrote he wrote the the Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, it is. It's Lawrence Kasdan. Lawrence Kasdan is going to be writing um, the, the new Star Wars. Okay. And he wrote he wrote Shadows of the Empire too. Oh fuck, I didn't know that. Sweet, you know. So like to have, I I think the thing is is that I'm and and I mean this sounds really nasty towards George Lucas. I I'm really happy that he. Um, that he's he's letting the Star Wars legacy go on. I'm really happy that all of that money is going to education. I mean, yeah. like, a big hand for that guy. All the respect in the world, you know? Anybody who still thinks that George Lucas raped their childhood and is a terrible person should leave the house. Um, but, like, to to actually go back to people who aren't so concerned with their legacy... Like this, this I think was one of my biggest problems with George Lucas pursuing the Star Wars uh, license, is that it is 
in the end, his legacy. And to become so, like, totally obsessed, and to become, to- like, so totally obsessed as George Lucas, that's going to be, that's a tall order. But when you hand it to people who, you know, know how to write, uh, and I don't, I don't just mean, I'm not being like, ooh, George Lucas doesn't know how to write, but I mean people who understand the nature of conflict and character development and uh, climax and tragedy and, and where these things belong in a story for the audience to feel gratified. And people that don't feel like their entire careers bank on whether or not Star Wars succeeds, then we're going to get much more reasonable Star Wars material. Uh, you were going to say something, though, Leon. Oh, oh all I was going to say is, um, you know, when they announced J.J. Abrams for it, and, and some people went, oh, no, I mean, who would – and, and I, I, I'm not – this isn't even rhetorical. Who would you actually prefer? think would do a much better job than him. I mean, you can, some people will say, you know, well, what if, you know, they, they mention all these sort of auteurs that have nothing to do with science fiction, but who would who would you actually prefer over Abrams? I mean... I, I would prefer practical effects in Guillermo del Toro. I want to see him do, like, aliens in the style of Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah. I want to see, see Nicholas Winding Refn do Star Wars. He directed Drive... I didn't see that. He directed Bronson. Yeah. He he did the Pusher movies. He did Valhalla Rising. People have described his movies to me as pretty fucked up. All right, that that fell flat. Okay. It was supposed okay. to be a joke. Ah, okay. Um, well done. Um, but no, I mean he he. he I mean the thing, guys, the thing guys. Is, all right, go ahead. I'm sorry. David Lynch's Star Wars. I David was, Lynch was slated to direct Return of the Jedi. He actually was. That's true. Um, but the thing is, as much as I, I love Lynch, um, it just doesn't really seem like a, the right fit. And 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 Abrams, even even though some people might groan at it, it it kind of does make sense. It just sort of it just sort of meshes together. I, you know what, like, uh, David Lynch, I have best heard described as being the greatest horror movie director who's never actually directed a horror movie. <laughs> Someone here hasn't seen Eraserhead. Uh, Shit's no. Scary as fuck. I've yeah. Got I've got that on goddamn VHS. It's not a horror movie, man. It's unsettling. <laughs> it's I've, I've unsettling seen, movie. I've seen every Lynch Austin, film except Eraserhead, so, uh. You just I'm cut just, them up I, like I, regular chickens. <laughs> Let's not do this, Johnny. <laughs> like that movie makes me feel like bad inside. Oh no, I have. In to heaven, see it. in heaven, everything is fine. Uh, I should use like the chipmunk lady as like the title card, but no one will watch. Do you want me to sing it? I will sing it. <laughs> I'm gonna kick you from the call. <laughs> hey, uh, Leon, I need you to I need you to tell me how you know the canon names of blue and yellow toads in Mario. Oh, because even though in the game they don't reference the toads' names. Uh, it is the developers said that that is their names, and it's Ala Gold, that's the yellow one or gold one, and it's Buck and Berry, which is the blue one. So even though in the game you don't see their names, uh, that is what the developers say their names are. Just like in, um, but how do you like, know that? Just, because developers, I, I've said this on the internet. No, like I think he's asking, like, did you read it in an interview? Yeah, like, where, where did you, yeah. you get this information? I don't, I don't have a link, but yes, I read, I read developer interviews on that said that's what it is. It's just like in Return of the Jedi, no one ever says Ewoks, but we know they're Ewoks. Do you know nobody says the word zombie in Night of the Living Dead? Yeah, huh. I know right. that. In fact, pretty much every goddamn zombie movie ever, nobody ever says the word zombie, except for yeah, but- Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, when he said, don't say the Z word. No, I was just thinking because that's the one where, like, that established, like, all zombie things that came after. You'd think that they would have said it at least in that one. Well, I mean, you know, let's say that it was certainly genre-defining, but it wasn't the first zombie movie to exist. Well, it was the first, like, ghoul movie. Like, there was, like, Caribbean zombie movies, like, white zombie and stuff, but... Uh, I know, and that's obviously where the association develops, yeah. so... We should just talk about zombies now, <laughs> Let's talk about Zombie Star Wars, directed by um, Wes Anderson. Last last thought on this J.J. Abrams thing. I don't even know if we're going to keep this whole part in the podcast, but are you guys worried about Star Trek and Star Wars being too similar stylistically? Like, I feel like that, like well, those two shouldn't well, look the no same. Well, there's no guarantee I, that they're going to be. 
you know, just because J.J. Abrams, like, I mean, let's, let's, uh, okay, all right. So uh, would you say that Star Trek and Cloverfield are similar stylistically? No, but they're not the same. They're not space operas. No, they're not space operas, but, I mean, they are from the same director, you know? Yeah, but I'm saying I feel like he would have to consciously, uh, like, avoid using his, you know, space style, like the lens flare and the things like that. I don't know. I I imagine it would probably really be easy to do. You just walk into the post-production and go, (laughs) by the way, no lens flares, please. (laughs) But would it really be him, though? I feel like he'd be changing himself. Well, yeah. Yes. I mean, you know, was AI really Steven Spielberg? Johnny. There were fucking lens flares of the ass in that film. You're an ass. Nah, I'm just, I'm talking, I'm speaking the truth with an F. Truth. <laughs> uh. It's, it's gonna be good, you know? It's gonna look good, at least. It's not gonna be this whole, like, green-screened everything, like... I just I want there to be like little to no CGI. I'm so done with it. Oh, there's that's, gonna that's, be CGI that's, in it. We we can't. There, there's no way it's not gonna be. I know, CGI. but I, that's what my favorite part about the old Star Wars movies are. We're gonna like, have I, sets though. I mean, real sets, locations that you can be like, wow, that's a fucking object. I'll, okay. I'll always I'll always say that uh, a model spaceship, you know, is always gonna look more real than the best CGI because you can tell it's a tangible object. Yeah. But it's just not the way it's going to be anymore, and and, yeah. and I just sort of have to, even though I'm not going to like it, I just have to accept that there, there's, we're not going back. We're just not going back, and I, in terms of space stuff, there, it's, it, it, we're, we're, we just have to sort of accept the CG uh, reality. Although you know, we we can't we can't actually speak for J.J. Uh, Abrams. You know, he might. He might think that the Star Wars, the original trilogy, is better for its practical effects. He might decide that that's something he wants to do, at least for, like, the life forms, for the aliens, you know? I mean, sure, we'll probably get some CG backgrounds, because, I mean, you know, let's be honest here. uh, Star Wars did not, the original Star Wars did not build every single set. Glass paintings were, like, a really, really big deal um, for their uh, uh, settings and whatnot. Do you guys even know? I, Leon probably knows. Austin, do you even know what a glass painting is? Uh, is, it, is the name kind of in, indicative, or is it pretty much? It's it's, it's it's what uh, it's the um, I guess the old version of, uh, of of green screening something. It's basic. It's basically it's the old version of, of CG uh, backgrounds. It, it's basically a painting. It's basically it's basically a yeah. painting that, that that makes it look like you're really there. It, and it happened. It happened a lot in old uh, movies. You can see it a bunch in old Star Wars or or uh, Indiana Jones stuff. And... Yeah, yeah. So we might. I mean, you know, J.J. Abrams might fucking storm into the Henson workshop and just be like, "Guess what? You're hired." And I would love that. That'd be awesome. I'm, I'm treating it like Kickstarter, where I'm going to be like cautiously observing it and then if it comes out and it's good then i I will be man enough to admit that it was a good thing but i don't know guys i feel i I can't stay much longer because we've gone almost an hour and a half now and you know me Um, the g-bone has spoken yeah gravity bone (laughs) gravity Gravity bone bone. has laid down the law we started we started a little late but yeah yeah that, that was partly my fault uh actually that's completely my fault um anyway uh gravity bone out so are you the j bone Nah. Are you going to J-bone out? Nah, I don't think it's like... Because he's the G-bone because it's gravity bone. I would be J-bone because J would be... Jodper's bone? Like, I don't know what. There are any good words that start with J. There are plenty. Mm, I don't think so. But not, I'm not buying it. The problem is that none of them have any kind of, like, edge. Jabberwocky. I, well, I yes, so I'm aware of that. But I'm not going to be the Jabberwocky bone. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, why not just be Jabberwocky then? <laughs> you gotta add bone to it. <laughs> it's the naming convention of our of our podcast. Speaking of our podcast, I think that that horny dolphin is like our mascot now. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the second time we've done that. The little horny dolphin. It's true. It's true. But I mean, it it was like that time. You know, it made sense, because it was like Echo, yeah. we were talking about Echo the Dolphin. And then before is the Dolphin Dildos. Yeah, we're not just throwing dolphins in willy-nilly. 
you know, we are using these dolphins sparingly. 